speaker, uh, and this will be the last speaker before um, our break, is Craig Truster. Uh, he'll be speaking on uh, Anthropocene to Holobiocene uh, and Theogenic Insights on Social Ecology. Craig M. Truster is an educator and citizen scientist that utilizes biomimicry and, perm and permaculture principles through applied mycology to develop regenerative solutions for many of the environmental challenges that impact our world. Through educational outreach, he has sought to provide people with the knowledge and resources to recognize and practically apply the benefits that fungi have to offer our health, environment, and society. Aside from Craig's work as an educator, much of his research focuses upon how might, uh, how might the qualitatively regenerative principles and techniques of permaculture be combined with the quantitatively powerful tools of molecular biology to paint a picture of the deeper ecological connections throughout nature facilitated by our microbial world. He believes novel approaches for bioremediation, carbon sequestration, and regenerative agriculture can be made a reality through research of fungi and soil biology, diligent observation of our surroundings, and intentional application of beneficial microorganisms. Thank you so much for joining us, Craig, and welcome to Science. Hello. All right, so. Just go ahead and get my screen shared. Hopefully everyone can hear me. Yep, you're good. Excellent. All right, well, I'm, while I'm waiting for my system to authorize Zoom, let's see here. Share my screen. Excellent. All right. So everyone can hear me. So hopefully you can all see my screen and I can see you. So hi. Um, so my name is uh, Craig Trester. Uh, I am a uh, citizen scientist and ecological educator uh, focusing on fungi. Um, so a lot of my work, um, given the presentation, is kind of seeing this deeper interconnection that uh, a lot of the microbial world um, has upon how we see our relationship with nature overall. So this is kind of an apt time. We're kind of at this moment of the Anthropocene where a lot of our views about nature and ecology were dictated by uh, human beings and that we were kind of atop this chain. So this will kind of be a bit of a historiography, a historiography between uh, concepts of um, our relationship to ecology, kind of the beginning of the environmentalist movement, um, how kind of uh, the the coming of age of biology as a science helped us realize a lot of re revelations about how to understand the compounds and uh, chemistry that happens in nature and how robust it is, and even to understanding uh, the molecular dynamics about how we're all connected. And then a, a brief detail of kind of out of the history of uh, how the initial uh, discovery and research in entheogens and social history has led into this kind of current paradigm we're right there. So we'll get started. Cool. So the Anthropocene, yes. Um, the kind of geological epoch where we as a species, one species out of so many on this planet, um, have had a, a profound effect upon, our, upon the planet as well, and potentially the, uh, the geological history. So it's interesting to think about how do we get here? How did this um, whole process begin? And this kind of comes to an aspect that, um, you know, very egocentric. Anthropic refers to humans um, and how we kind of view ourselves as more so we're on this planet, everything else is, can be subjugated, utilized, broken down, and how that's clearly caught up with us. We're at a point where it's kind of staring us in the face of whether we change our behavior, or we face a, a gradual shift in about our survival. And potentially realizing now we're part of ecosystem ecology, um, definitely entheogens help us realize this uh, quite apparently, um, this sense of oneness or wholeness or being part of a larger biological whole, this ineffable, uh, kind of feeling is we're learning more about through modern advances in sciences and even further kind of evo that we're all connected um, that you know evolution wasn't just an aspect of random mutation but also uh, a process of symbiosis so we'll be covering these details so the modern environmentalist movement uh, most people associate with uh, Rachel Carson publishing Silent Spring uh, mentioning a number of things about how the uh, chemical fertilizer industry um, and uh, chemical fertilizer industry and pesticide industry was affecting upon uh, many of the eco ecological biomes to uh, industrialize agriculture. Um, so this was kind of curated in 1962 as kind of the start of the uh, contemporary environmentalist movement. 
Um, we had other people like David Brower, uh, Paul, Paul Ehrlich that kind of took in this aspect, kind of looked at industrial society, said that, you know, the, currently the process which we've gone about has led to over exploitation of the earth, too many people consuming too much, but have this very heavy handed uh, overpopulation narrative, which we're going to elaborate on and kind of this understanding in general. So kind of the earth rise, that was the aha mo moment when we landed on um, the moon in 1969 and you know when fungi were formally considered their actual their own kingdom um, we're realizing that we have a this interesting place um, in the universe that we're in basically on this planet uh, and potentially the idea that we're one kind of larger biosphere this gentle blue marble into the backdrop of space upon the barren horizon of the moon so uh, our nest kind of really kind of uh, coined the term um, in 1973, in his, in his essay, uh, The Shadow of the Deep and Long Range Ecology of Movement, um, the aspect of deep ecology, that the factor is um, that maybe humans, maybe it's not all about humans, maybe we have a pretty strong obligation as a species that's able to manipulate our environment to understand that a lot of other things in life are interdependent. This is a strong um, ecological responsibility that we have to maintain. It's rather than being a master of the ecology, more of a steward. Um, and kind of this aspect that there's a spectrum of how we view whether it's uh, anthropocentric, that humans are the only thing relevant, uh, and maybe species that are more human-like or more animal-like or, or maybe further along aren't as relevant to ecocentrism. Maybe that uh, all living and non-living things are the center of our concerns. And a fair part of it, some people we've especially heard with COVID world is definitely we've been affected by this, um, by these zoological vector viruses because we have a large sense of balance and how we produce food and how it's affected our ecology, but also biodiversity. So it's kind of interesting, some people kind of get eco-fascist away saying, oh, we're the virus or it's overpopulation or details, when in reality, it's, it, we can kind of look at possibly more social ecology. So this is more, uh, Murray Bookin. Um, he um, actually was writing about similar points um, roughly the same time as as Carson and Silent Spring, even beforehand, but the aspect he looked upon was the aspect of social ecology, not deep ecology. The understanding that a lot of um, our environment is kind of this distractive process, that the ways that many of the problems we've had isn't about overpopulation technology, but how we interact, and maybe the methods and modes and we centralize capacities. So kind of trying to build a more compassionate world, a world that's more in touch with nature and balancing considerations out where there's value in understanding we're part of these ecological systems. Uh, and we're evolved out of nature and not so much a separate part of it as well. Um, kind of really nicely summed up, the philosophy of social ecology denies that there can be a complete separation, let alone desirable op opposition between human and non-human evolution as natural. So we respect the fact that human beings have evolved out of first or non-human nature as mammals and primates to form a new domain composed of mutable institutions, technologies, values and forms of communication. Social ecology recognizes that we are both biological and social beings. Indeed, the social ecologist goes so far as to be carefully analyze the important social history that has pitted humanity, humanity not only against itself, but very significantly against all, against the non-human nature as well. So huge statement that it's our relationship with nature and how we work with it and we can live in tandem rather than viewing this aspect of humanity being the problem or some aspects of it are too many of us that there's plenty of room on this biosphere we call Earth. So kind of this, this idea kind of stemmed out of maybe um, classical kind of views about biology, um, kind of the chain of being. This goes back to classical uh, theories about nature and dynamics um, and, you know, carried on to the uh, Middle Ages as well. Um, you know, kind of focusing, shifting on more to the, uh, the human-centric aspect and then even further this bifurcated to lending some aspects upon racism or considerations or with nationalities or ethnicities of lining in this aspect. So um, we move past this capacity with the aspect of modern science. We understand with the, uh, with Darwin understanding that you have the evolution of species that an organism is able, is able to survive in fitness environment. More so moving into the aspect of heritable traits, how those worked out to form a concept of neo-Darwinism. So neo-Darwinism was the aspect that we kind of viewed um, this dynamic evolution as random chance. This also kind of indicated an aspect of a lot of behaviors of competition, survival of the fittest, when even this, this, even this quote wasn't even attributed to Darwin. And even concepts about the influences of Darwin's theory was more so a product of the uh, socio-political economic considerations of the Industrial Revolution, given the fact that Darwin did come from a great uh, associated family of wealth in viewing these considerations. So neo-Darwinism, the aspect of this competition, this extractive capacity. 
However, this still has the ego problem. This does look at nature and understand there's a great biodiversity, but still it's the competitive factor. So this was the, one of the earliest considerations of the, of, of the basically the, the trees that we would look at all different species upon it, uh, looking at lower life forms to higher life forms, definitely not as degraded as well, but it's still very segregated. We understand common lineages, that things would randomly mutate and adapt over time based to their fitness and this environment. Fitness is more so the ability to reproduce, not necessarily the fittest or a more heritable, just merely stated by the condition of the environment. So symbiogenesis, this was something that uh, with endosymbiotic theory, a lot of people associate with Lamarguis, but was initially proposed by a number um, of, con uh, of previous biologists uh, that talked about that, really that you know evolution wasn't these gradual little shifts, but it was salutary, these large leaps and jumps that in the long history of uh, life's, uh, life's kind of geologic, uh, of Earth's geological history, there were cataclysmic events where species had to form together and were associated together to survive. Uh, Lynn Margulis, obviously, um, she states that when she first heard about the fact that mitochondria were potentially um, these, uh, these, these endosymbiotic um, bacteria that were able to, that were able to uh, use oxygen to produce reactions and combinations with their larger host cell that it was to break down their sugars, drove this course, the course, of, uh, this course of interest and career forever. So we understand now it's eco, that really it's not about competition, it's not an aspect that we truly are part of our, our organism environments. And this is understanding by uh, how, we, how multicellular life arose by these composite combinations of species. So this is a more example of how life emerged and fused and recombined together into the modern state as well. But we're only starting to realize this process that, you know, this was the factor back due to environmental stresses, you have this capacity of endosymbiosis by which you had multiple assemblages of organisms working together. So it's this kind of beautiful and a beautiful factor that we kind of understand how we aren't islands, we work together and how talking on the lower aspect of this kind of qualia, this ineffable experience of being one or whole in a, in a entheogenic experience does have some strong roots to in biology. Anyway, so we fast forward to the 70s, Carl Woos. Carl Woos formally understands that archaea, um, these, these far more primitive microorganisms were part of it and broke the, uh, the, three, uh, the three basically domains of life, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, which we are part of along with ants, uh, plants and animals, uh, with plants, animals, and fungi as well. However, um, upon, upon corresponding with James Lovelock, there was an aspect that potentially that this wasn't example, it wasn't fully articulated. Yes, we understand through molecular techniques and uh, looking at DNA that we could separate things and actually trace the heritage and heritability of these details, but there was potentially that these organisms in general, that they weren't simply just um, these, they, they weren't simply these component parts, but they were members of a larger ecosystem, these micro ecosystems, these micro ecologies and kind of giving on the aspect of the Gaia hypothesis that, you know, was, which, uh, you know, which Lynn was very strict about because the, because the literary affiliation that it was a uh, self-regulating geo-biophysical system where all ports, all parts of composite matter, both living and not living, interact to the self-regulate, that the environment impacts life, life impacts its environment. So what's really interesting now is that with effective, uh, effective molecular techniques, we're able to do next generation sequencing. Mind you, it used to be a hunt, a used to sequence a whole human genome used to cost hundreds of hundreds of million dollars. We can now sequence genomes for around a thousand dollars that we understand the hollow bio, um, the, uh, the hollow genome, the hollow bio, that we are a composite mesh of organisms, that we have our own genome, but there is a genome of the environmental metagenome, micro microorganisms that actually stimulate us, that actually help to develop certain details. So this is mind blowing, this deserves a lecture into itself, but we are truly part of the ecology because the first organisms that were able to survive in, on this earth were microbes. Evolving as a hollow binon is amazing because even between larger organisms, macroorganisms, we actually do share overlaps of these microorganisms, how we, how we function overall. And even further, these microorganisms, this, this, the holobionic, our own microbiomes, they affect how certain compounds we take interact, how our diet, you know, inter interacts our own kind of, interacts our own feeling and biology, what products are produced because they are metabolizing these compounds. They are for doing the process of fermentation because we are an ecosystem in ourselves. And this goes on to the whole aspect between all different, torp all different forms of higher life, uh, even to microorganisms to macroorganisms. So what's even crazier is the factor is that these organisms have an effect upon 
our own brain. It's called the gut brain axis in microbiota. It's the fact is that the microbiota is living in our gut, do metabolize a number of materials and have this feedback loop. You know, this even goes further to understanding how when we're born, how we get the first inoculum of a beneficial, a beneficial a microbiology from our mother's birth canal. And resultingly as well, much, much, of the, much of the nutrition we get from our mother's breast milk actually attracts the beneficial microbiology that basically help us to break down and digest this milk that helps bolster our immune system. These are so innate parts of our biology where they're basically inseparable. And then even further, the, feed, the feedback loops that you know, through, through the, we understand through the, vagal, uh, through the vagus nerve that these microbiologies are basically interacting with, much like we interact with a landscape or an environment, we modify it, we can, we can uh, lay waste to it, to devastate it where there's not much biodiversity, or we can plant or lush it, which will actually help to kind of this overflowing ecological diversity. And then even more so, we're understanding that they're producing a wide, a wide number of compounds uh, le leading, into, le leading into certain ones that actually promote brain health and brain activity and actually mediate and prevent, prevent damage. And so it's, it's a whole concept onto itself. So what we're realizing now is it's not so much a tree, but it's a web, that it's, it's entangled because we are proliferated by these microorganisms, that they affect us back and forth. And it's kind of amazing that, you know, the things that you grow end up growing you. We understand that our relationship with plants, they have their own microbiota. If I'm interacting with plants or fungi or some organisms, macroorganisms, there's going to be a composite exchange of this microbiology, which will drive these conditions. So what's really amazing is that, you know, my background is in fungi. So we understand these microorganisms, they have the aspect that their, their genotype allows them to do things that express them in the world. So we understand that with this Ophiocordyceps unilaterus, kind of the zombie and fungus, this is interesting because they parasitize these ants. Is this a phenotypical expression? Is this the factor where the phenotypical expression of the ant and phenotypical expression of the fungi behaving together, interacting, and the fungi is driving it one way? Is think about how a uh, think about how a beaver builds a dam or a bird builds a nest. That's a phenotypical expression. Is this mutual paratism, paratism intertwining as well? What does that mean? So it's amazing because this, this evolutionary complexity, they co-evolved together to associate for this mutual benefit. So it's blow, mind blown. You can look at the detail of the actual cell scaffolding. So even too, we understand that in certain types of fungi, where they do parasitize cicadas, they will actually produce a wide number, wide, a wide range of psycho, uh, psycho, uh, psychoactive compounds, uh, amphetamines like cathicone that we actually find in the cat plant, and even to producing psilocybin to modify the behavior of these, the, these, parasit, these insect hosts. So it's kind of amazing this factor of how this intricate complexity of what kind of where one activity starts, one activity ends. We kind of see more common associations with uh, lichen or mycorrhizal, mycorrhizal fungi, an extension of the organism. So these are more so as aspects of parasitism. We understand that in symbiosis, one end can be parasitism uh, based upon certain conditions, but in very much the other end is the actual mutualism or more so this enmeshing to this, this gradual benefit based upon selective uh, pressure and stress from the environment. So mass mass kind of even too, they'll, they'll basically modify the physical behavior to simulate a female in mating season that will help disperse these spores. So we understand that we've been able to identify the enzymatic steps that, um, that, that, uh, that psychoactive psilocybin mushrooms use. What, is this, uh, what are the enzyme steps to go as well? So it's been huge for our aspect to express these and uh, express these in fermentation organ, whether a yeast or, or, or E. coli. But what's even more so, how do these, gene, how do these clusters of genes move back and forth? Um, that's kind of the interesting detail that we want to see is that how, how have these genes been preserved for so long? They've actually jumped entirely in clusters. So this is the huge question is that we kind of think about what is this indication where these sets of genes have been preserved? Because we'll get into the factor about actually how long these, these organisms have been producing these compound sets of clusters and what is their functional purpose. Anyway, kind of going to the modern aspect. Uh, so we have uh, Richard Evans Schultes, um, kind of one of the considered as the established, like one of the huge proponents of ethnobotany in the 20th century. Um, you know investigated the, the relationship between certain types of plants and fungi. Uh, he's known for pretty much investigating uh, the psilocybin mushrooms. Um, even sent Albert Hoffman a sample of uh, Psilocybe Mexicana, uh, to which Albert Hoffman in 1958 was able to isolate psilocin and psilocybin. Um, this paved the way 
this paved the way for initial uh, initial research into into how how potentially certain psychoactive compounds, these psychedelics, might be able to uh, help people with great addiction with alcoholism or, or smoking, or even understanding help uh, help uh, help, help uh, mental health professionals understand what the actual physical state um, of their patients would be. Um, without a doubt, we have this we have this image here. We have Ralph Metzner, Timothy Leary. Uh, Richard Alpert or Ram Das in the aspect of, to when uh, they were doing their first studies in Harvard. And, you know, we understand the cat got out of the bag. We understand that uh, Timothy sought to change, um, kind of, uh, to change, revolutionize, or to awaken these aspects across a society. Uh, Ram Das sought that kind of change internally. Um, this ultimately led to the current policy and kind of embargo and information that we've had for, um, for several decades, uh, pretty much an entire uh, generation or two in general. Um, so the biggest thing is we understand is like we kind of see this rekindling of this flame, um, you know, through the McKenna brothers kind of where it was previously synthesized these compounds psilocybin was synthesized uh, in a the laboratory they weren't necessarily grown so we see the emergence of the psilocybin um, um, mushroom growers guide from McKen from Terence and Dennis McKenna and we see this kind of aspect this inquiry so almost to a meme status and now it's kind of reached this peach cultural state where a lot of implications of how weird nature is, how much of our world can we perceive that is or isn't there. Uh, Terence did talk about the factor that maybe like this was pre-made for humans. We kind of talk about the stone ape hypothesis. Um, we also can talk about the drunken monkey hypothesis where we were able to consume um, that uh, the alcohol de dehydrogenase uh, enzyme in our body was able to mutate that allowed us to eat uh, basically uh, basically fermenting fruit off the grounds, but also too, the factors we able to cook. So our jaws got smaller, allowing more cranial division. So psilocybe um, was basically um, confirmed by the Bryn Dettinger lab. Bryn Dettinger is based at the University of uh, Utah, um, runs his own lab out of there, does a lot of uh, molecular phylogeny, um, understanding uh, molecular dating of how old organisms are in relationships, was the uh, fungal director for Kew Gardens in the UK. Uh, and we understand that roughly um, psilocybin is around 20, uh, 28.33 million years old. So definitely before humans, but it's interesting to see what do these compounds achieve? Were they kind of a anti-feed agent for um, arthropods in times where there was way more oxygen, uh, uh, way more oxygen on Earth than they were uh, and far more likely to feed? So it's interesting to see what roles they play. McKenna does talk about it, how is this gradual symbiosis, the mushroom speaks, and you know the world is pretty weird. So it creates an open aspect. But to kind of keep in mind the aspect that we're currently at this point where we're seeing that we actually are a part of this um, gradual connection nature, this ineffable concept that, you know, this weirdness, this uh, concept of wholeness, oneness is a factor that we are ecosystems. And we're having this concept of being an individual. We're actually a, an assemblage of trillions upon trillions of organisms. So we, we fast forward to contemporary studies, impressive results uh, with, well, this is the study of joint sister study from NYU and, um, from NYU and uh, John Hopkins, um, enormous benefit for 80% of patients. Um, so if you guys have questions, start asking them now, it's the 20 minute mark. And also to understand it, so how does this actually happen? So a lot of it focuses on that, the thalamic filter, that the thalamus is this kind of filtering aspect that reality, intense reality is only a fraction of what we're experiencing. And that this default mode network is kind of keeping things in check. It's kind of keeping things where they should be going and that, but also too, in considerations of stress, grief, addiction, it's locked in phase. So it's the factor that understanding that through this interaction of psychedelics that we understand through um, these uh, 5-HT receptors, 5-hydroxytryptamine, which is serotonin, that these similar analog molecules are um, triggering our cascade, which helps break down this network. So what's interesting, everyone talks about serotonin 5-HT, but no one really talks about um, glutamine. So glutamine is, um, is the most present neurotransmitter in our brain. Uh, and what's really miraculous is that, um, what's really miraculous is that it's, it's a huge factor for stress-induced responses. So this was interesting. This study came out um, not too long ago and talked about the investigation of glutamine in certain parts of the brain, the presence or abundance um, leading to a, uh, an ego dissolution where there was high or low anxiety. Um, I'll scroll through these really quick. You guys can stop and take a look. Uh, but in general, they are basically talking about in the prefrontal cortex, there was a buildup of glutamate. There was, if, there was a, if there was a buildup of glutamate, excuse me, um, that relied to a more AD, an anxiety ego dissolution. However, if the glutamine was focused in the hippocampus, 
um, it was far less of an anxiety experience. So it's also understanding what, like how much of this aspect kind of goes down. How is this uh, biochemical change? Because in this kind of this aspect that if you hold on, you have this anxiety that you know just let it go, break through that you emerge from this experience, and that's kind of the anxiety we do feel when um, anecdotally we do participate in. In, um, in using these entheogens about what is actually happening. So it's amazing now with these studies, we're able to understand the, not just the serotonin, but also what are the upward effects in, neuro, in, uh, in neurotransmitter uh, neurobiology that's causing these different reactions. Um, so I'll kind of go a bit further, the study you can look into, but what's really amazing that I found quite interesting is that, so plant signaling, we understand that biology is, uh, is we understand that th that nature shares a fair amount of biochemistry between. So it's interesting that these inadult compounds are being produced by plants and fungi that fit quite neatly into our own, our own serotonin receptors. So it's interesting how glutamate will trigger this long distance uh, defense signaling. So if a plant is chopped upon or broken or brushed, they'll actually, they'll, actually, uh, they'll mediate this, this aspect in a release of certain calcium ion channels. So they, they derive this by a factor basically uh, producing uh, compounds that basically fluoresce green. These proteins that fluoresce green when, uh, when associated with this, uh, this calcium gradient response. And we'll play a quick little video that's about a minute or two. if you want the audio to play as well if there is audio um oh, then you um, should re it's fine I'll, I'll just i'll skip it so um this the video you guys okay. can plants have their own kind of nervous system but this part lays nicely so everything is connected whether it's an aspect of evolution by mutation or salutary integration into symbiosis nature is pretty weird and we're learning way more about it as we're at this point of an ecological crisis where we need to have better relationship with nature um as we understand our own inner space and our own our own biology through through molecular systems, and potentially what are they promising? Uh, what's on the horizon for us understanding this mind, this this grand mystery, this black box of biological kind of systems that we are? So I think that fits nicely in the Q and A. Thank you. Awesome, Craig. Thank you so much for that. Um, that was definitely a very full talk. Uh, lots of really interesting uh, concepts, ideas, and and you know, um, I think it really gives testament to uh, the ability of, you know, um, kind of uh, citizen researchers to be able to, uh, yeah, like really dive deep and uh, understand uh, some of these, some of these really complex pieces. Um, I'd love for you to uh, talk to us a little bit about, you know, if folks are interested in kind of uh, diving deep like yourself, you know, where, where should they be looking? Is the psychedelics ecosystem, you know, uh, kind of the mycological organizations you're a part of, are those really the, the hubs of this type of, you know, really deep holistic type of thinking um, on the science and research? Or are there, you know, other kind of uh, niche communities that are really looking, um, looking at things in this more holistic way? So um, it's a factor that when, if you were to go to a mycological society, um, everyone there is interested, interested in mushrooms in general, just mushrooms, understand much fungal biology, where to find the ecology. And it's the factor is, whereas a lot of culture, you know, you know, it's important we kind of clarify what connections fungi have because, you know, they're pervasive in our world, but most people's experience with them kind of either ends of the kitchen cutting board of the music festival. So it's the factor of this, this deeper overall connection. So I think uh, learning about your local mycological society, because there's plenty to learn about that it goes way beyond just a cap and stem mushroom, that there's all these pervasive roles, that these fungi that parasitize cicadas that do produce psilocybin, not that you could eat, it, eat them for appreciable amount, but literally using it to modify their behavior. So I guess a lot of it is understanding um, ecological considerations. Um, so for organizations, I'd say join a local mycological society because you'll be introduced to nature and plant biology and soil, and it goes deep. You know, I think a lot of people in the mushroom community got their introduction to nature and these dark, deeper connections through an interaction of whether it was going out finding mushrooms for gourmet capacities, maybe growing them in their closet, or maybe just somewhere, kind of somewhere in between the spectrum.
Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, also, you know, throughout the talk, you mentioned uh, some of uh, a well-known theory, the, the stone ape theory, and then um, the drunken monkey theory as well, which I haven't heard of before. I was wondering, what are some of these other kind of, you know, large, really, um, you know, uh, kind of awe-inspiring ideas, um, whether psychedelic or not, that you think people should be more, uh, made more aware of? Um, I think it's the fact is that a lot of how we view our world is this reductionist method, right? We zoom in on it. It's a lot of how our academic system is built because we can learn incredible things about my the complex systems in minute detail. But it's this holistic aspect when you look at the whole encompassing detail and learn these different factors. And you kind of have this experience and entheogenic kind of influence that, oh, everything comes at you once simultaneously and you see this bigger picture, you get a teasing of it. So I think a lot of it is the factor that living, being alive, these biological systems and how they're all connected in itself is a, you know, truly mind warping experience, but in the most beautiful and awe inspiring way. Because I think at the end of the day, whether we're um, going out on a hike and looking at nature and how it's complexity or, you know, under the influence of entheogen, awe is the deepest connection. So I'd say it's about understanding that things are connected on so many levels that we can understand both in a literal and a physical capacity that we're learning now through the progress of a kind of modern molecular ecology. Mm -hmm. The systems that we have built today, uh, everything from healthcare to economic systems, uh, you know, how much do you think that they actually incorporate some of these more holistic, uh, holistic understandings of the world? Are we really just at the beginning or do you think we've made some headway in particular uh, fields or, you know, societal uh, infrastructure? Well, I think we're at the beginning and I think what people are realizing is that it's not so much about holism, but resilience, right? And we're looking at the most resilient, robust systems are connected. They're built from the bottom up because it has this organic, natural framework to it. So I think people are starting to look at that, seeing how our many of our systems, and especially with this large ecological um, public health and, you know, global crisis that we're in are really kind of saying, okay, you know, the world isn't going to end, you know, as much as we may watch a movie and we'll see that. It's more of a slow burn. How do we work in this way to adapt and understand that, you know, life has seen so much in this world? Mm -hmm, definitely. Well, thank you so much for your time, Craig. Uh, I think we learned a lot and really appreciate it. So uh, looking forward to talking more offline. Thank you for having me. Take care. Yep. Bye-bye.